to our meeting of the Southern Shire Historical Society, our last formal meeting for this year. I'd especially like to thank the Deputy Mayor, Councillor Michael Borshaw, for attending. Thank you, Michael. It's good to see the interest some of the councillors have in the society. And Peter Scaife, Councillor Peter Scaifebrook, who was here last month, has come again. So he may end up being a regular visitor. Now, I have everyone's registered outside we're a COVID safe meeting here. Um, just for your information, the toilets are out to your left and the left again. And please everybody, would you mind putting your phone off? We had a miscreant last time, a visitor, not a member of course, I can't see him here this week. So um, <laughs> just make sure they're all off. And also the survey forms that a couple of our members of the executive have put together Make sure everyone's filled that out and hand it back in before you go because that gives us an idea of the sorts of things you're interested in, the society activities. So I'd like to acknowledge the Durrell speaking people of the, as the traditional custodians of the land on which we are gathered today and to pay my respects to their families and their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Now, I have the pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Ms Stephanie Bailey, who's here. Uh, Steph's the Discovery and Research Library Officer for Southern Shire Council Libraries. She researches and writes about the history of the local area. She also creates photographic records of the Southern Shire in the Sydney region and has won several awards for her images. Prior to her career in libraries, Steph worked in the television industry for many years and has had roles at Channel 9, Foxtel and Sky B in London, amongst other things. She recently provided historical research for a documentary on Western Australia's Kimberley region. So she's not just doing the shy, she has wider interests. Steph is continuing to examine the history of the Cook commemorations and their place in the wider Australian historical nar narrative. So here she is today to talk about commemorating Cook. Thank you, Hi, can everyone hear me okay? Yep, good. Um, okay, so yes, as Pauline said, my name is Stephanie Bailey and before I get started, I would also like to acknowledge that we are meeting on Durable Land and I too pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I extend that uh, respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who might be here today. Um, also, a little heads up, um, this presentation does include the names and um, some images of deceased persons, um, including those of Aboriginal Australians. I'll try and give you a bit of a heads up before they come on screen. Um, there are also quotes from historical sources, and in some cases use terminology which today we would be considering um, as inappropriate. So anyway, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, a big thank you especially to Pauline and Elizabeth uh, for inviting me. However, when I did agree to come along to this talk, um, I wasn't aware that I would be following the wonderful Paul Brunton. Um, that is a very tough act to follow. Um, although Pauline and Elizabeth have had made a habit of making me, uh, mixing me with rarefied company, um, that's my tip to my sister Charlotte to change the slide there. Um, so I did write chapter nine of the East Coast Encounters book and being included in this publication has been such a great honour. Um, unlike many of the other contributors to this book, I am not a Cook scholar. I did not grow up with an enduring fascination with Cook and his voyages. So how did I come to write about the Cook commemorations? Well, it was a massive fluke. Um, as Pauline said, I do research and I write about the uh, Southern Shire and I'm particularly attracted to the unusual and the quirky stories of the area. As part of my job at the Southern Library, I also take reference inquiries. And one day in September 2017, um, my phone rang and I took a call that has in many ways changed my life. The person on the other end of the phone was Mark McKenna. And for those of you who don't know, Mark McKenna is um, one of Australia's leading historians. He also wrote chapter 10 of this book. Anyway, to say that I was a bit of a fan was an understatement. So when Mark called, I was very, very keen to help with his inquiry. Thank 
Institute. So Mark was researching what became his wonderful quarterly essay, Moment of Truth, History and Australia's Future. And what he was interested in was this sign um, which stood on Captain Cook Drive just before the roundabout across the road from Martin Park at Kernell. And as you can see, hopefully, the sign reads, Welcome to Kernell, the birthplace of modern Australia. So what Mark wanted to know was, why was this sign here? Who put it there? When? Why? Um, I believe Mark may have spoken to some people from this historical society as well. Maybe? I'm um, not sure. Anyway, it turns out that this is not the original welcome sign at Kernel. There's been several. Earlier signs had welcomed visitors to the birthplace of Australia, later the birthplace of the nation, and then in 1993, Southern Shire Council Mayor Ian Swords stated that these earlier signs seemed to indicate that no civilisation had existed before the arrival of Captain Cook. So the word nation was then changed to modern Australia. And as many of you might know, the Welcome to Kernel sign was actually taken down earlier this year. And now we have this sign. The meeting place, Darawal Country. And I find this progression really intriguing. So to paraphrase Mark McKenna, these subtle but significant Shifts in the wording of inscriptions demonstrates reconsideration of the past in the light of new knowledge. Since when have we not been rewriting history? Now, Mark's quarterly essay was published in March 2018. The following month, on the 28th of April, the then Federal Treasurer, uh, Scott Morrison, State Environment Minister, Gabriel Upton, and State Attorney General Mark Speakman jointly announced that a multi-million dollar upgrade of the historic area at Kernel would be conducted as part of the 2020 anniversary. The development was to be equally funded by federal and state governments and include plans for a new visitor centre, a cafe, exhibition space, ferry wharves at Kernel and Lapurus and a new aquatic mon monument. And you may remember at the time um, that the proposed monument uh, in particular sparked a bit of debate and concern. After all, it had been just eight months uh, since the Cook statue in Hyde Park had been spray painted with the words, change the date, no pride in genocide. Obviously, COVID has meant that many of the plans for the 2020 anniversary were cancelled or delayed, but in the end, new sculptures were installed at Kernel. And um, I, I really like them, this in, one in particular. If you haven't seen them, get down there. They're really, really quite impressive. Um, but going back to 2018, I started to wonder, well, I wonder what this 2020 anniversary will look like. And that led me to consider how has Cook and that first encounter at Cave Botany Bay been commemorated in the past? What has that meant to people over time? What's changed? What hasn't? And obviously I had no idea back then where these questions would lead me. Um, but also, what do I mean by commemorations? Well, that can be a number of things. There have been uh, ceremonies, services, exhibitions, lots of other events, including those that were held for anniversaries or tied in with other national days. There are memorials, sculptures, artwork, souvenirs, um, advertising, memorabilia, and you'll probably see as we're going through this PowerPoint that I've started collecting some of those souvenirs and memorabilia. Um, there's also been the naming of places, roads, infrastructure, the list goes on and on. And of course there have been events and ideas that have been in protest, challenged, or offered new rethinkings of Cook for what the concept of Cook means. Um, and this becomes a very big subject very quickly, so um, we're just going to spend a bit of an hour on talking about this, otherwise we'd be here till midnight. So these days, 2020 notwithstanding, each year on the 29th of April, a meeting of two cultures ceremonies held at Cave Botany Bay National Park. This annual event, which includes a welcome to country, guest speakers and a guided tour along the Burrowong Walk, aims to recognise both the arrival of the endeavour and the traditional owners of the land, the Australian Aboriginal people. Um, to look at what I believe is one of probably the first um, act of commemorating Cook in Australia, we need to step back in time about 200 years. So on the 20th of March, 1822, Governor Sir Thomas Brisbane journeyed from town to the North Shore of Botany Bay with fellow members of the newly formed Philosophical Society of Australasia. The group then sailed to the south end of the bay and fixed a tablet in honour of James Cook and the Endeavour's botanist, Sir Joseph Banks, at what is now known as Inscription Point. Um, it's a bit hard to see, probably, but the plaque is up on that overhanging bit of rock there. Uh, and the memorial reads, under the all species, of, uh, all species sorry, of British science, these shores were discovered by James Cook and Joseph Banks, the Columbus and the Cenus of their time. 
This spot once saw them ardent in their pursuit of knowledge. Now to their memory, this tablet is inscribed in the first year of the Philosophical Society of Australasia, St Thomas Brisbane, etc, etc. So why did the Philosophical Society do this? Well, I could speculate, but unfortunately when you read the minutes of their society meetings, they don't really explain their decision-making process. So we're going to have to fast forward about 40 years to 1863 and enter the Honourable Thomas Holt. So as many of you would know, Holt, as well as being a financier, wool merchant and politician, was also a su substantial landholder. His estate, which extended from Botany Bay to Port Hacking, comprised the site of Cook's Landing. Like Cook, he was from Yorkshire. In 1863, on Holt's invitation, Dr. Henry Grattan Douglas, who was an original member of the Philosophical Society, spoke at a picnic that was held on the shore at Cornell. And at this picnic, Douglas spoke about how he remembered the tablet coming to be there. He said that Brisbane, Thomas Brisbane, had suggested the desirability of ascertaining the precise spot where Captain Cook landed and directed that inquiry should be made amongst the natives of Botany Bay if any of them saw the great captain arrive. The search was a long time discouraging. At length, an old black man was found, his hair was white from age, who had said he had seen the big ship come in and he could show the precise spot. Brisbane affected, sorry, Brisbane directed a plate to be prepared whereon was engraven the inscription that remains to this day, end quote. It's a great story. The only problem is that it almost certainly didn't happen like that. First problem with Douglas's account is that Thomas Brisbane did not actually arrive in New South Wales to take over the governorship from Lock and Macquarie until November 1821. That's four months after the Philosophical Society decided to put up the plate. Also, if there was any consultation with an Aboriginal witness to Cook's arrival, then the Society didn't document it. It's not to say it didn't happen or that it didn't happen perhaps afterwards, but it's, it's, you can't prove it. And finally, the location for the plaque was more likely chosen, not because this is where Cook first stepped ashore, but because it's a really handy place to put a plaque. <laughs> and if you want to find the plaque, it's further around the hub <laughs> God, this uh, further around the headland from the New Wales sculptures. Now, I took this depressingly unremarkable photograph back in February, um, which shows a signpost which points to a trail which leads to inscription point. So, so much for the, um, you know, the grand entrance to the oldest memorial to Cook in Australia. Um, I went there about two days ago to see um, to see if it had changed at all, and, and it has. So, the little sign at the bottom is gone, and so is the bin. But otherwise, it's exactly the same. <laughs> now, a quick fun fact as well, the State Library of New South Wales actually holds a replica of the plaque in their special collections, and I went into the library about a fortnight ago to have a look at it, and here it is. Um, unfortunately, the library doesn't have the exact details on when it was donated, they haven't got correct paperwork, but it, look, it probably came to them when the Royal Society, who came after the Philosophical Society, rehoused a lot of their materials in 1983. Up back to 1863. So the point I want to make here is that this was the moment when public interest of Cook in the Australian colonies really began to take shape. Although there had been a memorial to La Perouse for a number of decades, it wasn't until the mid 19th century, not accounting for one or two exceptions, that anyone paid much interest to commemorating Cook. There was the plaque, of course, and from around the 1850s, Cook had actually started to appear in a number of artworks. In 1851, a sculpture of Cook was displayed at Mr. Nichols Art Gallery in Woolloomooloo. And then in 1859, a depiction of Cook was included in the stained glass windows, which are in the Great Hall at the Sydney University. Also in 1854, a milestone obelisk with a tribute inscribed to Cook was erected by Captain Thomas Watson at Liverpool. Um, but it wasn't until 1863 that people really started to think about Cook and reflect on his contribution to, um, to history in, in this country. And from there, the concept of building a significant monument to Cook finally found some traction into this sky. Um, but as we know, the cogs of progress can move painfully slowly. And so although people had started to talk about Cook, um, it wasn't until May 1866 that Captain Watson, who built the milestone, um, called a meeting at which a committee creatively called the Cat's Cook Statue Memorial Fund Committee, was formed for the purpose of raising funds by public subscription to build this, what became the statue. The following month, the citizens of Sydney convened at a huge public meeting in the Hall of um, the School of Arts, 
to discuss the feasibility of recommending of erecting a monument to Captain Cook. Thank you. Um, so every man and his dog were at this meeting, the Mayor of Sydney, the Colonial Secretary, Aldermen, members of the Legislative um, Assembly, even the explorer William Hobble was there, and all of them had something to say. But perhaps the most verbose gentleman um, there was Mr Henry Parks, who took it upon himself to not only outline what the whole point of statutes are, what they're for, but why he felt that Cook was so deserving of one, what a shame it had been that he had been so long, long neglected by the people of New South Wales. Now, what's interesting too is that, especially given the controversy in recent years surrounding the, um, the wording of the inscription on the High Park statue, just what that inscription ought to be or could be was actually discussed at length at this very first meeting in 1866. So before they'd even considered what the statue would look like, what form it would take, who would make it, where it should be, before they'd even raised a single penny to pay for it, they were debating what the, ins description, um, the inscription should be. So Mr Driver, who was at the um, meeting, said, suggested, quote, this evidence of a nation's gratitude is erected to the memory of Captain James Cook. Henry Parks, on the other hand, in an unusually laconic moment, said that he thought the inscription should be just one word, Cook. And it wasn't just the high and mighty of New South Wales who had strong opinions on the statue either. So one of the really fun aspects of researching the history of the statue is reading the letters from members of the public to the editors of the major newspapers of the day. Um, <laughs> yeah, reading these is kind of like reading a really slow moving Facebook thread, um, but with much better punctuation, grammar and spelling. <laughs> I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, it seems like everyone had strong ideas on how the statue project should play out. Some inspired souls wrote poems in honour of Cook. Some offered alternative concepts to building a statue, for example, um, a lighthouse or a sailor's hospital. Some wrote to provide design ideas. Others suggested their preferred site for the monument, such as Garden Island, Botany Bay, the Domain, North Head or Wynyard. And still more wrote just to argue with whatever the previous letter writer had written. The public disagreement wasn't the fundamental problem for the statute committee. The big issue was that despite the initial enthusiasm for the enterprise, the public subs subscription money just wasn't coming in. So early on, they estimated the ultimate cost for the statue would be around 2,000 pounds. But by November 1868, more than two years after the big public meeting, they only managed to raise 138 pounds. And so the job for erecting the statue was handed over and that was over to the Australian Patriotic Association. So who were they? Well, the first Australian Patriotic Association are considered to be the first political party in Australia. They formed in 1835 and um, uh, advocated for the rights of emancipists, the free convicts, but they dissolved in 1842. The guys who were put in charge of this um, formed in September 1868 and they were for, quote, the object of promoting the political, social, and literary interests of all native-born Australians. Well, native-born white Australians, of course. Um, now, after much discussion, a site for the monument was finally selected, the eastern portion of Hyde Park opposite the museum, and immediately in line with the Prince Albert statue. It was also decided that enough money had been raised to get work underway on the statue's pedestal. And so it was proposed that whilst the Royal Highness Prince Alfred, the Duke of Edinburgh, nicknamed the Sailor Prince, was back in Australia after surviving an assassination attempt the year before, he could uh, lay the foundation stone for the statue. And he did this on the 27th of March, 1869, in the presence of estimated 12,000 people. Now, how many of these 12,000 actually paid something for the put the thing up? Anyway. It may be of interest to note that this royal, connect, this royal event has a shy connection. The elaborately crafted handle of the mallet used in the lame ceremony was made from wood cut from a honeysuckle tree that had grown close to um, where the place where Cook landed at Kernel. Furthermore, this tool had been especially presented to Prince Alfred by another, none other than the Honourable Thomas Holt. Another fun fact, next time you're in the um, Hyde Park, entombed in a cavity of the foundation stone beneath the statue is a bottle. And within that bottle is a facsimile of Cook's handwriting along with issues of the Sydney Morning Herald and the Empire newspapers. Now, when these items were buried during the grand stone laying ceremony in March 1869, it was anticipated that by the centenary of the Endeavour's arrival, the following year, construction of the Cook statue would be complete and it would be standing atop its pedestal. This didn't happen. So 
but this is an artist's interpretation of what it might look like. In actual fact, as we shall see, it will take another decade um, before the statue was finally unveiled. Therefore, when the statue committee met in April 1870 to discuss how the 100 year anniversary of the Endeavour's arrival should be celebrated, the group, group resolved that without an even nearly finished monument, they, quote, did not feel disposed to recommend the holding of any public demonstration in honour of the event. Saying that, the international exhibition, which was held at Kinkalka Park later in the year, um, was said to celebrate the centenary of Captain Cook's landing, but apart from saying that, they didn't really do anything specific to Cook. Um, now, exactly what Thomas Holt thought about this isn't known, but he wasn't about to let the centenary go unmarked. A year later, on 22nd of April 1871, it was announced, all the world will be glad to learn that a monument has been raised in New South Wales to the honour of the skilful sailor, Cook. The 12 metre tall monument, an obelisk perched upon a massive pedestal, was erected at Cook's Landing at Colonel Solly at the expense of Thomas Holt. It's constructed of sandstone, which was procured from here to where it stands, and is ornamented with brass plaques, one of which reads, Captain Cook landed here, 28th of April, 1770. This monument was erected 1870 by the Honourable Thomas Holt. Now, it's interesting to note here that the date is, um, says 28th of April, 1770, whereas nowadays we, um, we observe the anniversary on the 29th of April. Now, the reason for the change uh, has to do with the fact that when Cook travelled west um, across the Pacific and across the 180th meridian, he did not alter the date of his records until he arrived in Batavia in October 1770. Um, also, Cook used uh, nautical time, which uh, begins at noon and therefore is 12 hours ahead of the civil day. So it makes reading the, the journals tricky. Uh, so hence the change of date. Additionally, the plaque says that uh, it was erected in 1870, which yeah, might, have been, uh, might be true, um, but it wasn't actually unveiled until 1871. But back to Hyde Park. Well, there had been some progress with the statue following the Lane Foundation. The pedestal and shaft, which was designed by the architect M&T Blackett, was completed and polished. It's made from Moroyas granite and is massive. It's over six metres tall. You can see the guys standing next to it. So it's bloody massive. By July 1870, Sir Alfred Stephen, who was the chairman of the statue committee, had proposed the inscription, which is pretty much um, as it's as it is today. So on the north side is Captain Cook, on the east, Born at Martin, etc. On the south, Discovers Territory, 1770, and on the west, Killed at Owaki in 1779. But other people still thought that Cook was um, a sufficient in inscription, um, and so as so I was still unsure, for the time being, they just had Captain Cook carved onto the north side of the monument. The rest of the text wasn't actually inscribed until uh, late 1874, so four years later. But in 1870, that not only were they still lacking a statue, but they still didn't have a design for one. They also didn't have any money. So, what did they do? Well, they put a pole on top of the pedestal, as you can see there, and it stayed there for years. Um, in fact, it all became a bit embarrassing, and again, reading the letters to the newspaper editors is delightful. So in 1871, someone wrote this following letter to the Herald. Okay. In company with several friend, friends, I paid a visit to your city during the exhibition time, and feeling a laudable anxiety to see what had been done to commemorate the discoverer of our country, we, we proceeded along Park Street in order that the full glories of the erection might burst on us at once. Having reached a point where I suppose the effigy of the great navigator should be visible, I stopped and said, look, turning an expectant gaze to the spot. A dead silence seized us for a moment. Well, observed one of my companions. I always thought Captain Cook was an Englishman, but I see he is a Pole. <laughs> <laughs> and then, not much for a few years. Um, in April 1873, the committee requested funding from the New South Wales Government, and this was debated in Parliament. A year later, the Legislative Committee did vote to place £2,000 on the estimates to complete the statue. In the meantime, someone perhaps fed up with waiting, hoisted an effigy of Cook, dressed in a blue coat, frilled shirt and cocked hat on top of the pedestal. I'm not sure how long it was up there for though. And finally in October 1874, in the same month that Captain Watson unveiled, quote, a well-executed statue of Cook and his Renwick premises, the New South Wales government finally authorised the British artist Thomas Woolnett to complete the statue in England. 
they sent him some photos of the pedestal and shaft as it stood in Hyde Park, we presume for the pole as well, as well as suggestions that they'd like the design to be like the sculpture that had originally been uh, displayed at Mr Nichols Gallery back in 1851. They also said, they also told Woodner that £2,000 had been appropriated by Parliament to finish the job. Yeah. <laughs> now, Mr. Woolner, so he had a look at these photos and he considered the specs of the pedestal, which is massive, and he responded that such a huge pedestal is obviously going to require a huge statue, and that was going to cost a bunch more. So, Woolner's quote was £4,000 for a bronze statue, so double. Okay, says the government, and Woolner sets to work. But these things take time. It was not till three years later, in December 1877, that the statue is ready for casting and sent to the founders. And at the time, it was the largest statue that had ever been cast in England. By June 1878, Warner had finished the statue. So it's time to ship it out to Australia, right? Wrong. Well, not quite, anyway. Uh, instead, the Cook statue is placed on a temporary pedestal in front of the Athenian Club in London on the corner of Waterloo Place and St James. Um, it stays there for a couple of months. Then finally, um, in September 1878, the statue leaves England aboard a ship called the Hereford, along with 468 other Im immigrants bound for Sydney. The cargo on board the ship was stated as being 3,528 packages of iron, 38 rolls of lead, 100 drums of oil, 1,132 sash weights, 36 planks, 620 iron pipes, 116 packages of fancy goods, whatever that is, um, two cases containing pianos and one case containing a statue, brackets, Captain Cook. Now, after months at sea, the Hereford arrives in Sydney in December 1878. Um, sadly, there were 10 deaths on board the voyage, during the voyage, and they were all children. So, in February 1879, almost 10 years after laying the foundation stone, the statue is placed on its pedestal, undercover. Um, originally, they chose the 14th of February, the anniversary of Cook's death, um, for the date of the great unveiling, but then someone remembered that Cook didn't just die on that day. Um, the circumstances surrounding his death were quite violent, and they, everyone thought that was a bit grim, and so the unveiling date was pushed back until the 25th of February. And uh, so the day was declared a public holiday, and it was an absolutely massive event. All around, about 12,000 people were estimated to be in attendance. The unveiling was performed when a flag that enveloped the statue was hoisted by six seamen, all of long service. The oration was delivered by the governor, Sir Hercules Robinson, and Cook was spoken of as a man by whose own abilities and industry raised himself from an honourable position to the highest reputation, celebrated in every part of the world. He possessed the qualities of courage, fortitude, patience, self-denial and resource, as well as respect for the rights of others and sympathy for the sufferings of others. It's interesting, I find the language that's used to describe Cook, both here and at other times throughout the, um, the history of the commemorations. Um, he, here he becomes like a tangible represent, representation of the aspirations of the country. So despite humble beginnings, he accomplished extraordinary feats through determination and hard work, much like it was hoped Australia, uh, what would become Australia, could and would. Also, Cook provided a foundation narrative that was, rather, well, it was free from the rather messy business of convicts. So it's no wonder that over the years, Cook has often been connected, both deliberately and instinctively, with other national events and commemorations. Australia Day in 1788, of course. Um, so, for example, the medal on the left is from 1888. It was cast for the 100-year anniversary, not of Cook's arrival, but of the first fleet, but it's got a picture of Cook on it. And the plate is from 1830, uh, sorry, 1938, so the 150th anniversary of um, first fleet arrival. And again, it's got Cook on it. Um, also, following the First World War, with Anzac Day and the anniversary of Cook's arrival both falling within the same week, you do find um, quite a commonality in the language used to describe both the Anzacs and Cook. For example, indomitable will, splendid courage, great endurance, vast energy, tenacity of purpose and perseverance. And another example of Cook being appropriated for a national event came in 1901. So on the 1st of January of that year, Australia became a sovereign nation when the British Parliament passed legislation which permitted the six Australian colonies, renamed states, to govern independently as part of the Commonwealth of Australia. In the week following this process, known as Federation, celebrations were held throughout Australia in the form of huge public parades, concerts, military displays, sports carnivals, special church services, and, and lots more. Now, as a fitting climax to these festivities, 
the powers that be decided to stage a giant picnic on the foreshores of Botany Bay, followed by a reenactment of Cook's Landing. Oh, and this next photo's got um, uh, Aboriginal people, which wouldn't be alive anymore. Um, so playing the parts of the local Weagle people were 25 Aboriginal men, mostly from Queensland, who at the request of the New South Wales Premier, William Lyne, had been personally brought to Sydney by the protector of Aboriginals for South and Central Queensland, Mr Archibald Neston. Now the date for the big event was the 7th of January and the weather conditions were terrific. And this was especially fortunate for the organisers because around 5,000 people, including parliamentary parliamentarians from all the newly federated states, along with New Zealand representatives, sailed to Botany Bay for witness the event. Didn't have a road down there for quite a few years yet. Now, as the reenactment of Cook's Landing was not scheduled to commence until the late afternoon, visitors to Canel had several hours in which to enjoy their picnics in one of two specially designated sections. For the government guests, a decadent banquet enclosure had been cordoned off just above the beach, whereas those without a special admission ticket into the exclusive area had to remain outside its boundaries or else deal with the consequences of a misunderstanding with the police. In either case, it would seem that alcohol and sunshine eventually took effect. So although the atmosphere remained jovial, it was a bit raucous. Um, so all day, an ancient looking vessel had quietly lain offshore. So as to avoid anyone mistaking the reason for its being there, someone had helpfully painted the name Endeavour, spelled incorrectly, <laughs> across its bow and stern. Eventually, at 3 p.m., the reenactment commenced when someone on shore fired a number of rockets into the air, releasing fire balloons. This incited two small boats to push off from the side of the Endeavour and begin to slowly row towards shore. Their journey was, however, hindered by the fact that they had to travel in an irregular semicircle around a small fleet of fishing boats which was blocking their way. Now down at the water's edge, uh, some of the Aboriginal actors pretended to fish while others pushed bits of seaweed around with their spears. It was only when the sailors were almost at their destination that their presence was startlingly noticed by the actors on shore. But then ensued an extraordinary scene which not only involved the Aboriginal men dashing up the embankment to alert the rest of the heavily armed party, but also the graceful flight of half a dozen white trousered policemen who had inadvertently strayed into their line of route. <laughs> Yelling in loud defiance of boat crews, the Aboriginal actors, now with several cameramen in pursuit, ran back down to the water's edge and threw spears at the white men with, quote, a consistent inaccuracy that was astounding. And I'm just going to read the next bit from the evening news because you'll we'll see why. Okay, so this is the evening news. There were many little incidents in connection with the Cook Landing drama at Kernel which could only be regarded in the light of improvements on the original ceremony. For instance, when in 1770 the great navigator stepped ashore, there was, un there was unless narratives of the event are misleading, no brass band to enliven or add dignity and impressiveness to the proceedings. <laughs> Neither had the intrepid Cook the assistance of Mr. Daisy and a number of equally earnest parliamentarians in keeping the crowds back and out of the way. No strong posse of police under a perspiring sub-inspector shooed off the ubiquitous cameraman who beset his path. No ready-made jetty awaited Cook, up the steps of which his crew could lightly trip or behind whose timbers refuge could be taken from the flight of Aboriginal spears. Lastly, no specially constructed platform bordered with turf and banquets, decorated with palms and evergreens and confronted with rows of chairs and carpet-covered benches the spectators was ready, wherein Cook, in comfort, could express his sentiments on that auspicious occasion. There then followed numerous speeches punctuated with bold allusions to the British Empire. One rather long recitation was delivered by a, wearing, a woman wearing what looked like a fireman's helmet, and uh, she was supposed to represent the newly founded federated, the newly federated nation of Australia. This was followed by more speeches, toasts, music, cheers for all the actors, and finally an exhibition of spear and boomerang throwing, much to the delight of the spectators. And it sounds like everyone had a pretty fun day out, but whether this was the much hoped for fitting climax to the Federation celebrations is another matter. Thank you. Um, so at, throughout the 20th century, commemorations were held at Kernel on the anniversary of Cook's arrival, as well as often on the anniversary of his birth. And these were generally um, a pretty sober affair, involving speeches and lots of breaking of the flags, ceremonies, they also lots of quite like bunting. Um, now, although there were occasional reenactments too, um, but perhaps the most ambitious and prestigious, or perhaps extraordinary, depending on your point of view, were those staged in 1970. So during the 1960s, 
there had been repeated attempts to generate some action from Prime Ministers Holt and Gorton and get the ball rolling on organising the bicentennial celebrations and for the Commonwealth Government to take a lead role in the planning. This didn't happen. Between September 1966 and May 1968, New South Wales Premier Robert Askin had also formally approached the Commonwealth Government on three occasions in the hope of establishing a collaborative effort for the bicentenary. But when no fitting reply was forthcoming, Askin announced in May, 9, 9, May 1968 that his State Government had decided to take the initiative in planning and carrying out a program of celebrations. Thank you. This is Coles in the city, I think. Um, so Prime Minister Gorton finally did um, appoint a Commonwealth Director and in October 1968, and that was Rear Admiral George Oldham. He had a pretty unenviable task. Oldham actually soon realised that, realised that any attempts to achieve meaningful objectives would be constantly thwarted by persistent governmental interference and obstruction. And after the Bicentennial, he wrote a really scathing report on, on, um, on his experience. Um, so Oldham wrote, few things that the Commonwealth did in commemoration of Cook appear to have made a significant impact upon the attitudes and memories of Australian children. Even less effect seems um, seems likely upon new settlers who came here in the bicentennial year and no beneficial effect at all upon the status or attitudes of Australian Aborigines came from the Commonwealth's contribution to the celebrations. Indeed, the small part these original Australians had in celebrating Cook's achievements was arranged despite and not because of the Commonwealth's involvement. Um, so, probably the main contribution for the bicentennial from the Commonwealth Government where they um, had some commemorative points and set the commemorative stamps for issue. Um, the stamps were actually designed by a team which included the novelist Tom Keneally. Um, of course, there's the Captain Cook Globe and the water jet in Lake Burley Griffin, which was even working on the day when I took this photo in 2008. Uh, I quite like that one, the, the Cook Fountain, to be honest. But when it first went up, a lot of people weren't best pleased with the creation. Um, some description of the fountain include the plumber's friend, um, the abhorrent torrent, um, and my favourite, the biggest bee day in the world. Um, Oldham also read in his report his initial findings when he, when he took on the role. He wrote that only in New South Wales had active and well-directed planning begun. In New Queensland there was enthusiastic confusion. Uh, Victoria, firm opposition to any suggestion of celebration planning ahead of the announcement of the Royal Visit Program, and in other states, an apparent reluctance to perform, to become involved in the expensive planning commemorative program, which at that stage was considered by most to have no direct association with local history and development. So we're not happy. Therefore, as the Cook Bicentenary um, didn't really have a national coordinating agency, it was destined to be a predominantly Sydney affair. And not surprisingly, the Southern Shire would play a fundamental role. Um, this is a quote from Southern Shire President Arthur Geetzel. He said that because of the Southern Shire's unique situation in relation to the event being marked by the celebrations, it is obvious that the Shire and its community will become, and in my opinion, should become more involved than any other area or centre of population. Um, and from that, there was established the Southern Shire Captain Cook Bicentenary Commemoration Committee. Um, and seven subcommittees were also formed, and they would arrange different aspects of the celebrations and work to emphasise Premier Aspen's key themes for the Bicentenary, which were commemoration, competition, carnival and culture. Uh, and there was no shortage of job ideas for local events and activities, some of which transpired, others didn't. So some of the achievements within the Southern Shire include the creation of the amphitheatre at Gunnamatta Park, there was Greenpoint Observatory, um, the Southern Shire Symphony Orchestra was established, there was also numerous sports events, art, dance, music and garden competitions, there was also a major historical symposium which was organised by Norman Horwood, who was the secretary of this very society. Um, and it featured an address by the world-renowned author, oh, authority on Cook and Banks, Professor John Beagleholm. Apparently it was a, a big success that one. Uh, it's also the Just Banks Plant Preserve at Creelia, Forby Southern Memorial Gardens, which actually uh, opened the following year in 18, uh, 1971, and E.G. Waterhouse Community Gardens. There's a like great pop or plenty of tree. I think he actually did that the following year. Oh, there was also a Miss Bicentenary competition. Um, and that was won by a Karen Bar school teacher, and she won a trip to the Gold Coast with a chaperone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was also put forward, I hope no one's good. It was also put forward that the men of the Southern Shire should grow a beard during the bicentennial period. 
with the best beard winning a year's free haircuts because, you know, Cook famously didn't have a beard. Um, this was one of the proposals which didn't eventuate. Uh, this is more of my strange collection. In June 1969, Federal MP for Hughes, Les Johnson, pointed out that there was another important element to be considered in the anniversary program. He said, the state government has no plans for an Aboriginal role in the bicentenary celebrations, he said, and this has drawn adverse criticism already. Um, in the end, uh, Southern Shire um, did uh, get some additional... Um, uh, at Kiranari, they had some additional... Um, extensions put on there. So that was, uh, so they did that. But Johnson did, uh, he foresaw that if the Aboriginal community was not adequately consulted, acknowledged and involved in the commemorations, it was highly likely that Indigenous leaders would declare uh, 29th of April, 1970, a National Day of Mourning. Um, and in the end they did, not just because of that, but they did. Uh, so after the reenactment, uh, the Herald wrote that Black Australia did not forget Captain Cook yesterday. While well, thousands of white Australians crowded into the reserve at Kernel to watch the reenactment of the Endeavour's arrival, several hundred people gathered at La Perouse across Botany Bay for a very different kind of ceremonial. Reefs were thrown into the water by Aboriginal leaders were carried out by the tide and drifted sadly across the bay towards the landing site. Now, many of those present at La Perouse had arrived in cars which carried stickers proclaiming that Cook is bad news for Aborigines or wore kingside buttons which read, I support Aboriginal land rights. Around their heads were tied red bands to symbolise spilt blood and they held placards with the names of surviving and banished tribes. Um, so the 29th of April 1970 was up to that point the largest national campaign by Aboriginal Australians and it revealed a readiness to utilise orthodox protest procedures. Stepping back to October 1968, Southern Shire Council were facing some really big problems. There were major issues regarding access to Kernel, still not the easiest place in the world to get to. The historic area was also in an appalling state and in desperate need of tidying up. Cat's Cook Drive was also in a big mess. It was basically being treated like one long tip. President Geertsel had already asked for a three-way governmental division of costs to improve the road system to Kernel, but help had not been forthcoming and the situation had become urgent. It was even suggested that if the Southern Shire Council failed in a renewed bid for necessary financial input, then the proposed ceremony should be abandoned altogether. Uh, there's Mr. Gitzel, towards the centre of the picture. Uh, so without going into too many of the um, financial worries, the long and the short of it is that the state government, uh, who were actually ones that were organising the reenactment at Kernel, they did uh, eventually offer $40,000 to assist in carrying out certain work on Captain Cook Tribe. Now, although this money did go some way to help improve the appearance of the area, it was not nearly enough to overcome the access problems. There was no alternative but to just sort of make do with the resources available. Um, it's a bit hard to see, but this is um, the layout, the plans for the, um, the reenactment. In June 1969, Mr Asher Joel, who was chairman of the State Government's Captain Cook Celebration Citizens Committee, a really long name for these committees, and there's that 150,000 to 200,000 people were expected to attend the Kernel ceremony. That's a lot. Other reports anticipated even more. Now, given the topography of the landing site and the lack of road access, this was patently impossible. Now, someone must have had a word because by the end of August, both Joel and Premier Askin were encouraging the community to stay at home and watch the broadcast on, of the reenactment on TV. People will travel to the ceremony just despite those who told them not to go, predicted Councillor Norman Proven correctly. Another one with the layout. By mid-morning on Wednesday the 29th of April 1970, Kernel was full. In order to secure a spot in the viewing area for the reenactment ceremony, people had started to arrive at Cook's Landing Place as early as 3am, that's nearly 12 hours before the presentation was due to commence. At 10.45am, a helicopter that was hovering over the approach road to Kernel had sent a message to the authorities. The historic area had reached its maximum capacity. The police had no choice but to stem the continuous flow of traffic at Captain Cook Drive. At Woolaware High School. Undeterred, thousands simply just left their cars by the side of the road and walked the rest of the way. Um, this pitch has nothing to do with it, it's just some um, uh, Captain Cook Forge Discovery game, but that's in my collection. Uh, now, amongst this resolute convoy was our speaker from last month, Paul Frampton, who was then a university student. Paul had been motivated to attend the reenactment by an interest in the history surrounding the Cook anniversary 
Mostly, he just wanted to see the Queen, who was going to be there. Paul had travelled by train from his home in Punchbowl to Cronulla, and from there, he and some friends then made their way on Kernel by foot, a distance of more than 10 kilometres, along a road which Paul told me was not much more than a bush track bordered by sand, lots and lots of sand. Once there, he was fortunate to secure a spot quite close to the obelisk, and so he was able to enjoy an excellent view of proceedings. Another person who had great view was the Queen. She had arrived with Prince Philip, Princess Anne, and a long list of dignitaries and politicians in Botany Bay aboard the Royal Yacht Britannia. Becoming, before becoming, coming ashore, the Royal Party had made a brief tour of the Endeavour 2, which was anchored nearby. Um, now, the vessel that was playing the part of the cook ship was actually a Canadian bark, Sally Bark. It was originally named the Monte Cristo, and it had been built in Vancouver just two years earlier. There had been efforts in the 1960s to get a replica of the Endeavour built, um, but this had been relied on public donations, and that went about as well as the statue in the previous <laughs> century. The money just didn't come in, and in the end, the project was scrapped. So, oh yeah, and um, after the reenactment, the Canadian Endeavour 2, this one, it hung around in Sydney for about three months. It was birthed at Circular Quay. And during this time, around 100,000 people came aboard to inspect the vessel. In August, it sailed up to Brisbane, where it was birthed in Brisbane Harbour. But in October 1970, the ship was actually arrested under a Supreme Court order and writs were issued due to the fact that they had racked up $18,000 in unpaid debts while they were in Sydney. The vessel was eventually released at the end of January 1971 and then sailed to New Zealand where it um, immediately managed to get itself wrecked in heavy seas in Parangaringa Harbour, which is a bit of a shame. Uh, but back to the reenactment of Kernel. So on land, a special stand had been constructed to accommodate the Royal Party and around 800 VIP guests. Now once we're all were duly seated and ready, the action commenced. But the first scene in the afternoon's events definitely was not listed in the official schedule. And I'll quote the Herald here. Bursting in on the ceremony, a false cook suddenly streaked towards the landing site in a speedboat from the direction of the Colonel Oil Jetty. As the speedboat sped across the prohibited area, the intruder, dressed in 18th century costume, stood in the stern waving an enormous British flag. The speedboat pulled up beside the flat rock rising from the water close to the dais. Royal dice. The false cook, with one leap, jumped onto the rock, waving his flag from side to side. Then doffing his hat, he bowed to the Queen, who ignored him, <laughs> raising a program ostensibly to shade her eyes from the sun. Uniformed police rushed across the sand to the water's edge, but the rock was out of reach. Get your feet wet, yelled someone in the crowd as the police stared across the water at the intruder and his speedboat driver. Another doffing of the hat, another wave of the flag, and the two sped away. Both the false cook, who was a 19-year-old engineering student from the University of Sydney, and the helmsman of his vessel, and another student, were quickly arrested by water police and taken to Cronulla Police Station for interrogation. They later got offered a pardon. <laughs> oh, here's another fun fact. <laughs> um, the gentleman, oh, I won't say Sam, but um, I believe he's still alive, who was the false cook. Um, I believe he ran as um, the candidate for the Clive Palmer United Party in the 2013 federal election. Oh, no. <laughs> anyway, but back to the reenactment. With the illegal interlopers dealt with, the reenactment proceeded in silence. The public address system was on the blink and could have been only crackles. The troubles with the PA were caused when climbers, in a bid to gain a better view of the action, accidentally upset the cables which were strung through the trees. So although the television viewers at home were unaware of the audio problems, only the first few rows of spectators at Kernel could hear any of the dialogue or narration. Out in the bay, Aboriginal actors in characters as a member of the Gleagle clan paddled around in, can can sorry, in canoes that had been cunningly constructed of bark pine and fiberglass. They received their cues by aldous lamp signals. Nearby, two skin divers were armed with spears digitally guarded a stingray that was treated with shark repellent and he'd been brought to the site from marine land at Manly. The Stingray's presence in the reenactment was attributed to the fact that Botany Bay had initially been called Stingray Bay by Cook. Unfortunately for the Stingray, it was also there to be speared by one of the performers. Um, I, I do think it was actually already dead, just quite um, Now, although the absence of audible commentary was a drawback, all the choreographed action did take place. But when Premier Askin stepped up on stage to make his address, he spoke into a dead microphone. Fortunately, technicians were able to rectify the problem halfway through a speech, and so when it was the Queen's turn to speak, the crowd could hear every word. And in part, she stated, 
The name of Captain James Cook will always stand high among those men of genius who have unlocked the secrets of the world. We honour the man who first opened their way, way for Western civilization to come to this continent, bringing with it its blessings as well as its troubles. May this great spectacle and the memory of the man whom it celebrates inspire us to create the best possible world for the future. Following this, the Queen planted a Norfolk pine tree and then she, Prince Philip, Princess Anne, and most of the patient VIPs left the Colonel along Captain Cook Drive. Back at Cook's landing place, a massive water show was staged for the thousands of people who had battered their way to Colonel for the anniversary celebrations with or without transport. Um, and if you'd like to see, um, uh, actually see the Bicentenary reenactment, the State Library of New South Wales has digitised the film recording and has made a cut down version of it available on their um, website through the Eight Days in Came online exhibition. The original one, uh, original film goes for about an hour and this is about half that. Okay, so nearly there. Over the year, Cook's arrival in Botany Bay and that first interaction with members of the Weagle clan on the 29th of April, 1770, has meant different things to different people. Progressive generations have therefore chosen varied ways to mark this historic event. The manner in which this anniversary has been observed in the Southern Shire has also been influenced by numerous movable forces, political and social attitudes, public expectations, financial input, technology, constraints on access and location, and even the weather. Many of these challenges, and indeed opportunities, will likewise confront those engaged with coordinating prospective commemorations. But by looking, looking back on how things have been done in the past, better informed decisions can be made in the future. Thank you. Reminisce about something about their experience of that day. Yeah. 